we said earlier that uh, there were three issues here, and someone asked the question about the third question in terms of salvation by faith, this important sermon. And um, the third question is, how may we answer some objections? How may we answer some objections? And Wesley considered many of the kinds of criticisms which might be in the minds of 18th century Anglicans in terms of his teaching on justification and regeneration. Uh, and one of the first objections that he dealt with was this issue, well, this teaching will drive people to despair. It will, this teaching will drive people to despair. Uh, well, if, if that's a despair of attempts at self-justification, that's a good thing. You should despair of all of those attempts at self-justification, justifying oneself. And we saw that even in Wesley's own life, especially when he was in Georgia. He was trying to manage his spiritual life by rule, by resolution, uh, by obedience uh, to the moral law, a number of different things that we find there uh, in the journal. And so if the teaching of justification by grace through faith alone causes us to despair of all attempts at self-righteousness, then that is a good thing. That is a very good thing indeed. And then some people objected to Wesley's teaching uh, on justification by grace through faith alone that it was, quote, an uncomfortable doctrine, an uncomfortable doctrine. Well, what is meant by that? What is, that, what is meant by that? Um, it, it's, it's, it's interesting, uh, but Wesley responds to this criticism that it's an uncomfortable doctrine. In other words, it's a, it's a strange sort of teaching and we can't fit it into our lives well, therefore it's uncomfortable that Wesley responded to that criticism by quoting materials from the Anglican church. Yes, yes. He quoted the 39 articles. He quoted the 39 articles of religion in particular. What do those articles teach? That, quote, that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort, very full of comfort. Uh, and so here, Wesley is turning the table on his critics. He is suggesting that the Anglican Articles of Religion itself refer to this teaching as a comfortable doctrine, a doctrine very full of comfort. And so, uh, we see uh, the influence here uh, uh, of the Reformation. Now, at the end of this sermon, Wesley does something that he later on regrets. Uh, at the end of this sermon, Salvation by Faith, uh, he refers to Martin Luther as, quote, the glorious champion of the Lord of hosts. Okay, that's how he refers to Martin Luther, you know, shortly after his Aldersgate experience when he preaches this sermon, Salvation by Faith. Later on, after 1741, when Wesley reads the Galatians commentary, uh, he wants to retract this statement because he doesn't like what Luther is saying about the moral law and also about about reason. Luther, for example, called reason a whore, uh, you know, for an example. But uh, I think that Wesley misunderstood, misunderstood Luther, what, what Luther was, was teaching. Um, uh, and you already know that the Galatians commentary greatly helped Charles Wesley. It fed into his evangelical conversion. But Wesley did not have the same view. 
He read the Galatians commentary, did not like what Luther was saying about reason. You know, Wesley even defines the proper Christian faith. Remember, I've been saying real, true, proper, scriptural Christianity. There's one place where he refers to it, scriptural Christianity, rational Christianity. Yes, rational Christianity. Because in Wesley's mind, reason is a sanctified reason. It's a gift given to us by God, and it should not be deprecated. The way Luther is referring to reason as a whore. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and he also did not like what Luther had to say about the moral law, putting the moral law in the context of sin, death, and hell. Uh, because you already know, for Wesley, the moral law is a great gift. It, it, it gives illumination in our lives, the expression of the will of God. So at any rate, Wesley removes this accolade for Luther, that glorious champion of the Lord of hosts, he removes it later on uh, because after he read the Galatians commentary. As I've said to you before, though Aldersgate was an important uh, spiritual event for Wesley in his journey, uh, all was not well. You know, I, I've said that earlier and so I'm saying now, all was not well. Wesley still has some things confused in his mind and it's going to take time to sort them out. And so, though Wesley obviously profited much from his acquaintance with the Moravians, some of his theological and even spiritual malaise after his Aldersgate experience was due in large measure to their erroneous teaching, what they had contributed to John Wesley. Okay? For one thing, the Methodists, excuse me, the Methodists, the Moravians had led Wesley to believe that justification and the new birth, which necessarily accompanies it, would eliminate not simply the power of sin, but also the being of sin which is not the case, is not the case. Either that or Wesley had simply misunderstood them because when Wesley was en route to England on board the Samuel, uh, he wrote in his journal at the time with unreasonable expectation, unreasonable expectation. The faith that he wanted, he writes, is a sure trust and confidence in God that through the merits of Christ my sins are forgiven and I reconcile to God for whosoever hath it is free from sin. The whole body of sin is destroyed in him. Well, that language of the whole body of sin is destroyed in him is not the language of regeneration. That is the language of entire sanctification, okay? And so we're going to see here that Wesley may have confused early on the graces that pertain to regeneration or the new birth and entire sanctification. Let me, uh, let me just go to the blackboard here and describe it this way. That, and, and it's going to take Wesley, he will produce two sermons later on, actually in the 1760s, uh, on sin in believers and on the repentance of believers, where he makes these very careful distinctions. Uh, but these careful distinctions are not present in 1738. It's going to take Wesley time to sort this out. But... Uh, we have justification as freedom from the guilt of sin. The guilt of sin. We have regeneration. Regeneration as freedom from the power or the dominion of sin would be another way of saying it. And then we have uh, entire sanctification as freedom from the being of sin. 
the being of sin. And by the being of sin here, Wesley, Wesley means, you know, the carnal nature, original sin, etc., etc. Okay? So Wesley has these careful distinctions in terms of justification, regeneration, and tar sanctification. And this relates to the issue of freedom. Freedom from the guilt of sin. We receive the forgiveness of sins. Freedom from the power and dominion of sin. In terms of regeneration, freedom from the being of sin. Now what we're going to see here is that Wesley has this kind of mixed up at this point. You know, these kinds of liberties, they're confused. Uh, and he also has mixed up or confused uh, the whole question of assurance. Uh, and, and he's going to have to think more clearly about degrees of assurance, degrees of assurance, and whether or not one could be justified and born of God without assurance. And interestingly enough, Wesley's going to say in rare cases, special cases, yes, you could be justified and born of God and lack the direct witness of the Holy Spirit due to either ignorance of the gospel promises meaning you do not realize this is promised in scripture, Romans 8, for example, uh, or due to bodily disorder. In other words, due to some sort of perhaps illness or, or physical constitution whereby you cannot realize uh, the direct witness of the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, that's where we're headed. We're gonna make those distinctions, but it's, it's kind of, confused those two areas, doctrine of sin and assurance for Wesley. You know, it's mixed up. The Germans would say gemischt. Uh, that's what it is here. Uh, and so we are saying that not all was well uh, after Aldersgate, that Wesley has to articulate his theology more carefully. He has to articulate his theology more carefully. Uh, we can give an example of this when we look at an early sermon called the Almost Christian, which was produced uh, in 1741. And when Wesley is describing the altogether Christian, and see, this is, this is the question of ambiguity. We're dealing with ambiguity. And sometimes I struggle with Wesley because he can be ambiguous, and there are other areas of his theology which are somewhat ambiguous. And, you know, various interpretations would be viable. Um, but here he's raising the question between the almost Christian. See, I don't think it's hard to understand what the almost Christian is. The almost Christian, who's the almost Christian? They're the one, they, they are virtuous, they are moral, they are socially responsible, but they're not born of God, okay? Uh, so that's not hard, the almost Christian. But the altogether Christian, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by the altogether Christian? Do you mean, do you mean this or do you mean a mixture of this? And see, this is where the confusion may come in. Uh, because when Wesley is defining the altogether Christian, he is defining the altogether Christian in terms of entire sanctification, okay? And is that what we mean by the altogether Christian? Is the altogether Christian synonymous, the same thing as saying a real Christian? See, we have these questions where there's ambiguity, it's ambiguous here, and it becomes a little, little difficult. But when Wesley defines the altogether Christian in this sermon, he says, listen to this language now, all his desire is unto God. His delight is in the Lord, his Lord and his all, to whom in everything he gives thanks. All his desire is unto God. Well, are all the desires of a Christian unto God? Uh, are their hearts pure? Uh, are they utterly uh, focused and consecrated to God? Uh, that's a question. And so we have some difficulty here. 
okay? Uh, because Wesley is saying that, notice what he's saying this sermon, unless all his desire is unto God, he is um, not almost, well, uh, the one whose desire is unto God, he is not almost only, but altogether a Christian, okay? So that, that raises a problem for us. That raises a problem for us in terms of interpretation. Uh, Wesley, as I said to you, is very clear in those two sermons in the 1760s on sin and believers and repentance of believers. But in this sermon, uh, the almost Christian, it's a difficult sermon to understand. I think it expresses some of Wesley's misunderstandings that are in place in 1741, and it's going to take him time to sort it out. Because in this sermon, these characteristics that we've been describing, all his desires unto God, are descriptions not of the new birth, but of entire sanctification. Okay, um, And so... Uh, it's going to take time for Wesley to realize, you know, a justified person is free from the guilt of sin, regenerated person free from the power of sin, and an entirely sanctified person free from the being of sin. <coughs> now, watch this. Watch this. I may be getting Wesley in trouble. I may be getting him in trouble now. Because if Wesley is preaching that someone who is justified and born of God, all his desires are unto the Lord. In other words, that his heart is pure, then maybe that's the reason why they said to him, John Wesley, preach here no more. Because there are some confusions here going on in terms of, to express it another way, John Wesley thought at Aldersgate, he received not only freedom from the power of sin, but from the being of sin, which he did not. And he's come to realize, he's going to come to realize he didn't receive freedom from the being of sin, that the carnal nature remains even in a child of God. That the carnal nature remains even in a child of God. It remains, Wesley writes, but it does not reign. See, so freedom from the power and dominion of sin is in place, okay? Um, and so, um, Wesley is now looking at the Moravians a little more critically because maybe everything that they communicated to him was not, was not all good. And so, Wesley still desired greater contact with the Moravians, especially after his Aldersgate experience. And so he set out to Herrenhut. He set out to Herrenhut, which is a Moravian settlement about 30 miles from Dresden. So it would be in, I suppose, modern Germany today. Um, 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 maybe the Czech Republic as well. Uh, I'd have to look at that. Um, and in, he went there in the early summer of 1738. 1738. And by July 4th, uh, Wesley had reached Marienborn and had a conversation with Count Zinzendorf. And Count Zinzendorf was one of the principal leaders of the Moravians. Okay. Um, when Wesley gets to Herrenhut, this, this Moravian community, ah, the chickens are coming home to roost. Because, watch this, the Moravians refused to give John Wesley communion. Yeah, they refused. And they referred to him, they referred to him as homo perturbatus. Homo perturbatus. Uh, in other words, a perturbed uh, Per to, I, do I have that spelled right? Per, ter, that should be a U. Per, ter, per to, batis. Well, at any rate, I'll check the spelling later on. Uh, homo perturbatus, and in other words, a perturbed individual. A perturbed individual. Uh, because they realize that Wesley, in some respects, is unsettled. He's unsettled in his theology. He's got some confusions going on. Uh, and it's going to take, uh, <coughs> 
there should be an R there. Perter, Perter, Bottas, yeah. Um, there are some confusions going on in his theology, and it's just going to take time to sort them out. It's going to take time to sort them out. So he has this conversation with Christian David. He has a conversation with Christian David, uh, and also with Michael Linner uh, and Arvid Graden, Arvid Graden. Uh, among others. So these are some Moravians he's dialoguing with while he's in Hernhut in the fall of 1738. Uh, and Christian David says to him that though sin still stirred in him, though it still remained, it did not reign. And so Christian David is making a distinction there between the freedom of the new birth and the freedom of entire sanctification. And Wesley later on uses almost this exact language to describe his own theology, where he talks about sin remaining in a child of God, but it not reigning, okay? So the carnal nature remains, or a heart bent towards backsliding, original sin, what we call, it remains, but it does not reign. It should not break out in the expression of actual sin. Uh, and so uh, after his trip to Herrenhut in October 1738, Wesley wrote, I dare not say I am a new creature in this respect, for other desires arise in my heart, but they do not reign. They do not reign. Uh, and so Wesley's now starting to see the importance of these distinctions and not confusing the liberties of the new birth with the liberties of entire sanctification. Um, Michael Linner, another Moravian that Wesley had conversation with, he sort of complicated things for John Wesley by insisting uh, that when one is justified, uh, that one should have, and, and if one is justified, one is also born of God, that one should have full assurance of faith without any doubt or fear, okay? So, so Michael Linner was teaching John Wesley that insisting that what we call full assurance which excludes all doubt and fear, uh, should accompany justification by faith. Wesley, there's evidence to show that Wesley actually, that was his own view at one point, uh, shortly after Aldersgate, uh, but then he realized that this is not the case, that there are degrees, degrees of assurance that full assurance without doubt or fear pertains only to entire sanctification. That the assurance that pertains to a child of God, in other words, someone who is justified and born of God, their assurance is occasionally marked by doubt and fear, okay? So these are distinctions that Wesley will later make. Okay, it's, it's all kind of confused and mixed up in 1738. Uh, he's realizing uh, that he needs to theologically do a little retooling when he's at Herrenhut in the fall of 1738. Uh, and so if Wesley was confused about his doctrine of sin, which he was. He's got the liberties of the new birth and entire sanctification mixed up, and he has to separate them out. He was also confused in a second way, in a second manner, in terms of assurance. In other words, he was expecting full assurance even for a child of God, and that is not the case. Because a child of God, even someone who's justified and born of God, their assurance is occasionally marked by doubt and fear. Okay.